Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever time you're tuning in the program here at FlintTalkRadio.com, Flint's number one podcast program in the city of Flint, Genesee County, and we're trying to um, win your trust to become statewide known and also throughout the country. Uh, this is a special program this afternoon. We are taping it at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday. And we have a special guest that's not in the studio, but he'll be talking to us over the uh, live feed. And that's Mr. Scott Bowman. Mr. Bowman, I want to welcome you to the program this afternoon, sir. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Okay, I do understand that you're running for the hot seat down there Detroit. In, the, in Detroit. Tell us what you're running for, what the office is. Yeah, it's um, Detroit City Clerk. And uh, given I saw the um, the appointed manager on Chris Wallace's program yesterday, and he was talking about the myriad of problems facing Detroit. So why do you want to throw your head into the ring, given all those problems that the city is facing? <laughs> well, I'd, I'd say it's all it's all the more the reason to get involved. If everything's working perfectly. I don't need to go and fix what isn't broken, um, and it, it clearly is broken right now. We have. Um, I've been coming with lots of complaints from people um, in the city complaining about not being able to find information when they try to get it from the city clerk's office, um, not being able to vote because they get to the wrong location. Um, that may have been where they voted all, all their life. Suddenly they're told they have to vote somewhere else, and maybe it's too late to get to the other location, or the poll worker doesn't even know where they're supposed to go. So we have definitely some serious problems in the city. There's been um, cases where money has been lost because the city clerk doesn't um, have um, proper attention to the records. And there's been, um, and, and for, and most recently, for instance, there's not even a proper adherence to the city charter. Well, it's really interesting that uh, you're talking about the things that are broken there. I know the city council has had its problems, and I was uh, watching when the appointed the president city manager to uh, look over the affairs of the of the city and uh, that tension between Mayor Bing and the uh, city council uh, came through and uh, it is really a lot of things that are going on uh, haywire uh, in Detroit. I have to tell you that I'm, I'm um, kind of a long-standing citizen quote-unquote of Detroit. My father um, lived in Detroit. I was in Birmingham, but I would visit him in the summertime. And I came to a very vibrant city, and it just really is amazing to go back to that time period some years back and then look at the city today. And it's like uh, looking at um, uh, the difference between, uh, quantifiably speaking, between night and day. And so uh, yeah. there are a lot of problems, as you said, in the city. What, what would the clerk's uh, role be? I know you're saying about the, you're saying the voting um, uh, uh, the, the chaos even in the voting uh, situation. Is there anything uh, outside of the electorate part of the process in Detroit that the city clerk would in fact uh, be able to play? What, what other roles would they play? Oh, um, definitely. Well, well, pretty much all of the city records are under the stewardship of the city clerk's office. And the um, knowledge of when the city seal has been put on documents is um, supposed to be um, kept and um, recorded at the city clerk's office. The, um, and this can include, for instance, land purchases or land sales. Um, if the city of if Detroit is the one doing it. Now, other um, issues regarding real estate are handled by the Wayne County um, clerk office. But the city does handle all records concerning its own business. Okay. Um, are you getting any um, interference on your end, by the way? No, it sounds good here. John, how's it sounding in the studio it's there? It's sounding okay. He just it sounds like he's moving around a little bit or something, but it could be because of the phone connection between, you know, a cell phone and a landline. So that's what could be the problem. So, hmm. But you sound, you, you're sounding good overall. Yeah, you're sounding really good. I'm, okay. not, I'm not having a problem myself in hearing what you're saying, and I, I'm sure that's also true of the uh, listening audience. Uh, in, in terms of um, your candidacy, you're running uh, not on one of the two major parties. Tell us about uh, what party you're running on. It's nonpartisan. Oh, non the um, elect Detroit has nonpartisan elections for um, all of its city offices, and so there isn't any um, any 
you know, locking into the straight ticket vote. People actually see who the names of the candidates they're selecting to vote on. So they're not voting for a party, they're voting for the individual. They, um, the way this works is we have a top two primary um, coming up shortly on August, well, it's actually already in effect. It ends on August 6th because meanwhile we have early voting and absentee ballots and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then what happens is the top two candidates for per seat available um, move on to the general election. So for instance, we have two at-large positions for city council, so four candidates move on for that post for the at-large city council positions. But for mayor and city clerk, only two candidates each move on. That, that is interesting. You, are you saying that the candidates don't have the party affiliation by their names? No, no on the ballot. It doesn't mean the individual candidates themselves can be involved in parties, and I've steadily spent most of my time involved with the Libertarian Party. Um, but the candidates, as far as their, um, when you see them on the ballot, there's absolutely no indication of any party affiliation. Well, that's a, that's a very refreshing change. Um, I noticed that um, mm -hmm. uh, in the ballots that I've seen, I don't think I've ever seen it where it didn't have the party affiliation on it, but that would be a tremendous change, because I think what persons are doing is voting party line, and sometimes they can't eat is not in that particular party, and we need to individuate it to uh, who is running uh, based upon the candidacy of the uh, persons that are seeking office. So is that is that uh, uh, par for the course in Detroit, where you don't have um, for, for all of um, for all of the local ideal elections? Yes, in other words, the, the, there are other offices people vote on in Detroit in in the even years, but those are usually county offices um, or state. I see. How many candidates are running for the city clerk's office? There's five of us right now. Okay, and two have to come out. Right now, because for a minute there were four of us, and then one candidate litigated her way back on the ballot um, because um, apparently, um, you know, what happens when people turn in petitions is how we get on the ballot. So there's no party nomination. Mm -hmm. We submit petitions to be on the ballot. And um, one of the candidates initially had submitted, um, you know, about 500 signatures, but then they go through and validate them, and they weren't able to validate all of them. But she fought it in court, arguing that perhaps some of the signatures that weren't validated should have been. I see. How, how many? Another five. How, how many um, um, signatures did you turn in as far as your candidacy? A thousand. A thousand, and there were 500 that were right. needed. 500 would right, be. and they said we could turn in between 500 and 1,000. I carefully counted out 1,000. They say I handed in 5,001, but I say it was 1,001, I'm sorry, but I say it's 1,000, <laughs> um, which is supposed to be the maximum number you hand in. I see. Well, uh, we definitely want to wish you a um, good, good speed on your candidacy. Uh, I, th I think that you ran for an office. Uh, was that in the last election that you ran for an office? In 2012? Um, yeah, I ran for um, U.S. Senate in 2012. Okay. I think that your candidacy um, at that time, and I, I said it at that time, and I think at this point as well, I think that the fact that you are a new light that is coming to the uh, surface again and have um, uh, some fresh ideas, I think that the time has come for the um, voters to begin to look askew at those who are bringing something to the table that they've not had before. And I think Detroit should be one of those places given its, its uh, present circumstance. Mm -hmm. So I think your timing is excellent for this, uh, this position. How is it looking down there as far as your candidates is, is concerned? Well, um, you know, you only have to come in second to make it through the primary. Okay. And what the past has indicated is that a supermajority of votes are going to be going to the incumbent if the past is any ind indicator of the present. However, um, I just need to come out on top then of the other four candidates um, to get through the primary. And after that, we're talking about we've got a few months to go before the general election in which I will be able to make my case that we do need change and also build a coalition with any of the people who are supporting any of the other three candidates beforehand. Yeah, I hope we'll, uh, what will happen is that um, when you come out of the uh, primary, then there will be a coalescing that takes place with the candidates that did not come through and that there will be some right. um, 
um, cleavage in terms of uh, moving the incumbents out of, out of office. I think we need to have an anti-incumbent anti movement in this country and um, because I think we need to, with some regularity, change these persons that are in power. Uh, what, what kind of, uh, you said that there was this problem with uh, the voting. Is there going to be a problem in this election coming up? Where the, uh, I sure hope, I sure hope not. Because, um, yeah, what happened before, um, actually the most recent problem with the voting, um, in addition to the issue I already spoke about, which was incorrect information. Um, but another problem we've had with voting is the counting of the votes. In 2009, our present mayor, Bing, won by 6,000 votes. But there was a recount, and his opponent, Tom Barrow, um, you know, requested that. And when they counted the, um, the ballots to do a recount, they found that there were six containers with about 10,000 votes apiece, so approximately 60,000 votes, that could not be counted because the containers that they're transported in, were, the, the seals on them had been corrupted. My goodness. And... Yes, and so as a result of that, there, there, there are ten times as many votes not counted as the margin of victory. My, well, that that's what I saw in 2012 on the national level. I was just uh, really uh, stunned. Well, not stunned. I was just really uh, disappointed. I guess the word is in terms of how the election played out. It looks to me like there were a lot of discrepancies in the voting outcome and what really was the will of the of the people in the uh, national elections, and it was just very disconcerting to see the happening where we're moving more and more toward a third world uh, country as far as our voting process is concerned. Uh, are, there any, are there any measures you're taking in this election, though, to make sure that every um, uh, voter is empowered and every vote is, in fact, counted? You see? Um, yeah, well, what I, what I want to do is make sure that every, when, when they transfer any ballots, mm -hmm. first of all, that we have a minimum number of transfer steps. Perhaps they shall be taken directly to a common hub might be one way to do that. Um, that when they count the ballots that they are, um, you know, every ballot that is transferred that the person understands they're responsible for signing off on a, on a container and the next person signing on to it, um, they need to take turns. I used to, I, here's an example, I used to donate plasma once upon a time. And you know, the way plasma would work, they'd take blood out and then they'd put the um, cells back in with saline solution. And I know this is getting a little off track, but this is right. going on. Right. In that process, you can understand that if they put the wrong cells in the wrong person, you know, they give you the wrong blood back, mm -hmm. that that could kill you, right? Right. So they have procedures for that. And what you do is there'd be these labels on each item on you and on the package, and you'd read, the, both the patient would read it out the package, and the person putting it in would read it out the patient. And there's double checks to make sure there are no errors in that transfer. We need to have a procedure similar to that when you transfer containers of ballots. I mean, if you manage to keep people alive at plasma centers, um, <laughs> it should also work for safe transfer of the ballots. <laughs> the other thing is any electric counting that's happening when you're feeding the ballots in should also be recorded and posted um, on the door of the polling station where it's happening. Do you have to have uh, driver's licenses uh, in Detroit? To vote, I'm not sure what the state's requirements are, but I, I, in the local election, is it required in Detroit to have a driver's ID or some kind of ID to identify who the voters are? No, they they um can ask for it, but you don't have to show it. Mm -hmm. they, they, some, they will give you a form, and people will fill out a form. Um, expressing, you know, basically it's kind of an added step where they're trying, to, they're trying to get people involved in the practice of carrying an ID in case it ever were to become required. And I think maybe just to kind of have a soft discouragement to fraud, the, you know, once again, it's essentially um, an honor system still when you're doing the form. I, it, but that's, um, that's it's, you can do vote without the ID, but it is um, kind of frowned upon to do it without the ID. I see. I read your posts all the time on Facebook. I don't know if um, I'm aware of your Twitter account, but I do read what you write on Facebook. And I'm aware of your ideas, and I support a lot of the things that you are trying to do. Um, what, what would um, your uh, basic purpose be? I know you're saying the voting. 
uh, where you have to clean some of that up in terms of uh, people not always having the right information about such things as where they're supposed to vote and things that the clerk should, in fact, be in front, in front of. What are, what are some of the particulars beyond that that you think uh, that's not being done now that you would do if you were, in fact, elected? Well, um, I, my platform is um, smarter service, total transparency, and more fairness. Um, included with the smarter service is that um, we can correct for the problem I was describing at the beginning of people not being able to vote at the right place. And one part of that is that if you don't change your address, you shouldn't have to change your voting location. Mm -hmm. As long as the place that you were voting at remains open, now sure, if like the business closes down or the building's demolished, yeah, that's impossible. But as long as that place is available as a voting location, you should be able to just keep returning there. I mean, this just seems like common sense. Um, and the other thing is um, we can delocalize voting so that people um, who, if they are at the wrong location, can still submit a ballot and then they just have to verify that if they haven't voted at the regular location before the envelope is opened and the ballot is counted. Mm -hmm. And so that way you still have a um, check on fraud at the same time that you're not denying a person the right to vote. I see. What, what do you expect to be the turnout, given the fact that this is not during the midterm elections and uh, you're talking about primaries in 2013? Uh, what, what is the projected turnout of the uh, voting populace in this coming primary election? Um, you know, I haven't heard specific projections, but I believe it, it's going to be very low. It's going to be a small, it's going to be a much smaller turnout than the general election, and the general election is a much smaller turnout than the overall. I don't have an exact number on hand or anything like that. But, um, you know, we have 700,000 people about in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, and of the voting age portion of the population, I think I've heard like maybe only a quarter of them vote. So uh, it's, um, it's going to be pretty small. Yeah, given the, um, the fact that this election is now uh, in between the um, midterm and the four-year election, we elect the president, a lot of folks come out. Um, your, your success is uh, predicated upon getting your constituencies out. And uh, who are those constituencies that you would say that you're trying to uh, reach and bring to the polls? Um, I would say, first of all, anyone who's um, been frustrated with any inconveniences in the voting process, <laughs> anyone who's tried to retrieve information online, and um, found that they had to wait on the phone for a long time or and maybe still not get an answer or show up in person when they didn't want to anyone because I'm going to put everything I, that can be put online online so that people who get their information that way can and people who like to use the phone or show up in person can still do that with a shorter wait time. Mm -hmm. The um, I also want people who are concerned about the financial situation our city is in who are um, suffering the consequences of a um, basically a bankruptcy that's on hold, but also receivership under the EFM. Um, anyone suffering from that um, should appreciate having me in office, because I think we could have more cost-effective ways of um, doing all the functions of the clerk's office, and, and we have more cost-effective ways of doing things that frees up more money to help people with their other needs in the city. Um, and reduces the expense associated with this office. Also, the um, the fact that people um, one way one part of this is citizen involvement in financial accountability. Mm -hmm. The way we can do that is having a more transparent um, clerk's office. Because right now, if you look up any financial records, they have broad sweeping categories that may involve hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars without any specifics. People need to be able to go online and look at every transaction, if they so wish, involving the clerk's office, um, because you know, especially at least any contracts made, um, any significant items like that, because um, it's everybody's business. You know, yes. this, this is the people's money, mm -hmm. and everyone has has a stake in this. We all need to know how it's spent. And I think a lot of times you can have people um, identify areas of waste, and that can be cleaned up. It also might expose cases if there is any, um, oh, how shall I say, nepotism or deals going on where really the citizens aren't getting their value for the money, but someone in a good position is. Um, that'll be harder to pull off if the people are watching over their shoulders. Mm -hmm. 
when I asked you a few minutes ago about uh, what constituents did you want to bring out to the polls, and you said those that are dissatisfied with the uh, delivery of services, I thought then to myself that you were talking about bringing all 700,000 persons out to the polls <laughs> because I do understand the uh, fact that when you have a $20 billion uh, deficit, the delivery of services is really a, a constant problem. You know, I have a, um, a relative uh, down in Detroit, and uh, they tell me when they go to the service station down there because of the absence of uh, police presences uh, in the city, that they have uh, one hand on the nozzle as they fill their cars up with gas, and they have the other hand on their uh, concealed uh, weapon, which they have license to, to carry, because of the crime rate is so bad in Detroit. And we've even had reports here that police have said that you come to the city at your own risk and um, because they can't really ensure your, your safety. Have things, have, uh, given, I, I know the financial situation is really uh, dire, uh, do you see any improvements going on? Let's not just talk about the, the clerk's office here, but what, what, what are some of the positives that we can uh, talk about as far as uh, Detroit at this, at this point? What are, some of the, what are some of the particulars that would be... Um, uh, yeah, I was just saying, what, what would be some of the things that you would say, um, some of the things we can build upon, uh, not just in your office that you're seeking, but just things that can be built upon to revitalize the city that was at one time the leading city in the United States? Well, I think it, it's about working right from the ground up. We can't, we can't rely on leaders in elected positions um, to make decisions for us. Um, otherwise, we just, I guess, get more of that. We, now we, you know, we depended on our city council and our mayor and, you know, to some extent, the clerks to just do things for us. And what we now have is a situation where not only are they not doing things for us, but now we have someone else coming in and doing things for us that we didn't even elect. <laughs> um, that's, people need to start taking a little more responsibility and handling things on their own. And I think one of the Good things in Detroit is the resiliency of the people living here, mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of the people are waking up and starting to take, um, you know, basically personal governance into their own hands. Um, one thing that w that we have in um, our neighborhood is we have um, I'm like vice president of my neighborhood patrol, and we're concerned about crime, and we you know we don't work totally independently because we still call on the police if we see trouble. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we act as eyes and ears and um, we look for, um, you know, people attempting to break into cars, for instance. We have had a huge problem with people doing breaking and entering into houses and, mm -hmm. and not just stealing property, but often stealing metal items like furnaces and water heaters and taking it in and selling it for scrap. Um, that's the kind of thing that citizen patrols can help look out for and stop. Um, not directly stop, but stop by creating a disincentive by reporting it. Um, we have um, had in the past, this clerk's office has actually certified the people doing the patrols, giving them a short training session, basically a list of do's and do nots. And they'd get an ID badge um, so that if they were driving slowly around a neighborhood, that if the police could, you know, thinking maybe they're casing out houses or something, stop them, they could show that they're on a patrol. So, you know, it's understood why they're actually there and they don't unnecessarily get in any trouble. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's something we no longer have because the incumbent handed over the um, charge of the patrol to the um Connie Kilpatrick, and after that, um, it got kind of dropped for a while. We have a lot of retired police officers who've kind of um, helped take over the role of helping people with their citizen patrols, and they meet like every quarter or so. So we've kind of brought it back, but it's, um, you know, I think it would be good to actually re give people certificates and um, name tags again that they could actually show um, if they had something come up when they were driving around. I see. How, how do you feel about the city manager that has been appointed to run the affairs of the city? Do you see it as a disfranchisement of the uh, voters, or you saw it as something that was necessary given the dire circumstances that are now gripping the uh, city? So we try to have a city manager system. They have a mayoral system, um, but perhaps you're talking about the emergency financial manager right, who's actually appointed by the governor, which is something right. different than a city manager. Right, exactly. And, um, yeah, it's totally disenfranchisement. It's essentially 
um, kind of like, you know, if you have an empire take over a country and they send in a governor to rule that territory. I mean, mm. it's kind of how people in Detroit feel. Mm. Do you, but but uh, you're right about it's the EFM uh, position. Uh, do you, but do you think it was necessary, given how the affairs were being run by the city council? I know there was a lot of friction between the city council and the mayor. In fact, I saw where the mayor and the city council were taking two different positions on the entry of the EFM. And uh, the mayor was, in fact, supportive of it, and the city council saw it as disenfranchisement. And, uh, but do you see it as something that was necessary and vital, given what was really going on, the friction, for example, between the mayor and the, and the, and the, and the city council, for instance? Do you s no. Um, I think it provides an easy cop-out for um, politicians who can't get their act together. Mm -hmm. And um, what I think what really needs to happen is it just needed to get, for it to get this bad was to wake people up and realize that, you know, they can't keep electing the same people who are yes. just going to get us in the same situations. Um, as far as if the person, if for instance someone like Kevin Orr has any special skills, as perhaps he claims he does at, um, you know, making the, financial wheels of the city run more smoothly, um, you know, this, the city council and the mayor have plenty of money they spend on consultants and staff and all this kind of thing. They could hire somebody who um, is competent at those tasks if they need assistance, um, and I'm sure they do, but they don't need to, we don't need to have one imposed on us that effectively not only does it take away the ability of the voters to select their own leaders, but it also takes responsibility out of the hands of the people who got elected because they can simply pass it on to the EFM and say, oh, my hands are tired, I can't do anything. Right. Well, I, I do think that uh, there is a better way to do it, and that is uh, to deal with the incumbents that have brought about the problems, and then let's have these, these changes in the incumbency with regularity, and that's what you're doing in your candidacy. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left. I wanted to ask you, though, um, in terms of your uh, campaign, you are running for the office of, of the city clerk. How um, mm -hmm. can they contact you in terms of your headquarters or where you're located? And how do they, in fact, um, contact you if you want to make a phone call to your office? Okay, well, my office and my headquarters is in my house. So I actually rather than to knock at the door, though my address is on everything, um, I'd actually prefer to either get an email or a phone call. Okay. Um, there's also a contact form directly on my website at scottybowman.org, and they can just key that in, and it'll redirect to the specific city clerk site. Um, and they can fill out a contact form there also, and my email address and phone number are posted again also on the website. And for those who, well, I guess there wouldn't be anyone listening who doesn't have a computer, but anyway, it's 313-247-2052 is the phone number. Mm -hmm. um, and but the website is scottybowman.org and there's no w at scotty b o m a n s c o t t y b o m a n dot org um yeah and you know you just go from there there's a lot of information also on that website um about some of the things i want to do and um, i also have an events blog that lists some um, upcoming events including this conversation we're having right now um right on that page and so you know, the plan is to make things um, easier on people um, as far as them being able to get in contact. I have a lot of um, literature that needs distributing. I could definitely use volunteers to hand out literature. Um, people who are not near Detroit can help by donating. I have a donation link on that page. Okay. Well, we are out of time, but I want to uh, thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon. I'm sure that the um, listening audience out there and the voters in Detroit will be uh, well served by paying attention to your cam campaign. And we wish you very well in terms of what will happen uh, by August the 6th when the primary will in fact close. Uh, thank you again for coming by, Mr. Scott Bowman, and Godspeed on your, on your election. Thank you very much, Mr. Moss. Okay.